with the graffiti. The site of Plato's academy and the house where he lived are almost certainly lost forever. Astonishingly, Hecademus' home is still there. Beneath the archaeologist's protective tin roof, you can see its exposed baked mud foundations and the remains of its mud brick walls, which were already almost two thousand years old by the time Plato set up here. Hecademus seems to have had a knack for immortality. Meanwhile, just across the wasteland is a modern encampment where conditions comparable to those in Hecademus's prehistoric home still prevail more than four thousand years later. Amidst the cardboard box dwellings and pools of stagnant water, shaven headed immigrant children play in the hot sunlight beneath halos of flies, while their head scarfed mothers sit bow legged among the refuse, suckling naked, dark skinned infants. What is justice? asks Plato in his best known work, The Republic. In this dialogue, he assembles Socrates and a cast of characters for dinner at a retired tycoon's mansion. By the time Socrates takes over the conversation, the company has agreed that there is no point in trying to define justice except in the larger context of society. So Socrates sets about describing his idea of a just society. The earlier dialogues, written by Plato but starring Socrates, are generally thought to contain Socrates' ideas. In the middle and later dialogues, these ideas undergo something of a transformation, and here the ideas put forward by Socrates are perceived to be Plato's own. The Republic is the finest of the middle period dialogues, and in the course of his prescription for a just society, Plato sets out his ideas on such wide-ranging topics as free speech, feminism, birth control, public and private morality, parenthood, psychology, education, public and private ownership, and much more. Just the sort of subjects you might go out of your way to avoid at any enjoyable dinner party. But the Republic was not to be an enjoyable dinner party, we soon discover, and the society it proposed was not to be very enjoyable either. Plato's opinions on the topics mentioned above are almost all seriously at odds with the opinions held nowadays by all but earnest bigots and the slightly crazy. In Plato's ideal republic, there would be no possessions or marriage, except among the lower orders who were presumably the only people fit for such things. Children would be removed from their mothers soon after birth and educated communally. In this way they would come to regard the state as their parents, and all their contemporaries would become brothers and sisters. Until the age of twenty they would be educated in gymnastics and uplifting music. No Ionian or Lydian music was permitted, only military marches to instill courage and the love of the fatherland. All this makes one wonder about Plato's own childhood. Sure enough, we learn from Diogenes Laertius that Plato's father made violent love to his mother, but failed to win her. Although Plato was almost certainly born in wedlock, his mother appears to have soon taken a second husband, and Plato was almost certainly brought up in a number of households, so perhaps it's no surprise that Plato had little time for family life. In Utopia, according to Plato, at the age of twenty, those who had shown insufficient appreciation of their physical and musical education were weeded out. These were dispatched to do menial tasks, such as support the entire community by being farmers and businessmen. Meanwhile, the superior students went on to study arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy for ten years. Maddened by mathematics, the next batch of failures was sent to the military. Now only the elite remained. For five years, until they were thirty-five, they were permitted the great honour of studying philosophy. Then, for fifteen years, they became involved in the practical study of government, immersing themselves in the ways of the world. At the age of fifty, they were considered fit to rule. These philosopher-rulers lived together in a communal barracks where they had no private possessions and could sleep together as they chose. There was complete equality of men and women, though in another dialogue Plato does let slip that if the soul fails to live well for its appointed time in a man, it passes into the body of a woman. Living communally, and having no personal interests, this elite would thus be above bribery and their only ambition would be to ensure justice in the state. 
From this lot was chosen the head of state, the philosopher king. Even for the small ideal city-state, nine miles from the sea, where this was all intended to take place, it would appear to be a recipe for disaster. At best it would be stupefyingly boring, for all poets, dramatists, and people who played the wrong type of music were banned, as were lawyers. At worst it would be a totalitarian nightmare which would quickly develop all the usual unpleasant methods required to maintain such an unpopular regime. With hindsight, it is easy enough to pick holes in this earnest fantasy. Even Plato's own description involves him in a number of contradictions. Poets were banned, yet Plato himself uses many superb poetic images in the course of his arguments. Likewise, worship of the gods, religion, and mythology were forbidden, yet Plato himself includes several myths in this work, and the philosopher-rulers bear an uncanny resemblance to a priestly caste. He also introduces an ideal god of his own who is implacable and must be obeyed, even though his existence cannot be proved. In fact, Plato's vision of the ideal republic would seem to be strictly a product of its age. Athens had just been defeated by Sparta in the Peloponnesian War. Neither democracy nor tyranny had worked, and Athens desperately needed government that could provide order. Indeed, some commentators consider that when Plato speaks of justice, what he often means is something more akin to order. The answer appeared to lie in a strictly controlled society such as that which prevailed in Sparta. But unlike Athens, Sparta was a Philistine, economically backward society, which in order to survive had to produce a caste of mindless hooligans willing to obey orders and fight to the death. The task of this caste was to inflict terror on the city's increasingly rebellious lower orders, and to cow its sophisticated and economically powerful neighbors. Plato was either ignorant of this, or unwilling to take it into account. In an extension of Socrates' naive ethical belief, the good are happy, Plato believed that the unjust alone are unhappy. Impose a just society, and everyone will be fine. But what did he suggest? Just the kind of blueprint you'd expect from an earnest, high-minded intellectual closeted in the grove of academe. It could never work. Yet the astonishing thing is that it did, or something like it did. For over a millennium medieval society, with its lower orders, its military caste, and its powerful priesthood, bore a remarkable resemblance to Plato's Republic. In more recent times, communism and fascism have adopted many of the Republic's essential features. For several years, Plato continued to teach at his academy, establishing it as the finest school in Athens. Then, in 367 BC, he heard from his friend Dion that Dionysius, the tyrant of Syracuse, had died, and that his son Dionysius the Younger had succeeded him. For years, Dionysius the Younger had been kept locked up by his father in order to thwart any ambitions he might have harboured about premature succession. Incarcerated in the royal palace, Dionysius the Younger had spent his days industriously sawing up pieces of wood, constructing tables and stools. According to Dion, this was the perfect opportunity for Plato. Here was the ideal ruler for him to instruct in the ways of the philosopher king. His mind would be uncluttered by other ideas, and Plato could put his theoretical republic into practice. For some reason, Plato didn't find this prospect appealing. Perhaps he was worried about the position of a sixty-one-year-old who arrived to take up residence in the ideal republic. Would he too have to undergo a prolonged regime of gymnastics and military music before he could join the elite? But in the end, my fear of losing my self-respect and becoming in my own eyes a creature of mere words who never put them into practice forced Plato to succumb to the entreaties of his friend, and he set out on the long journey to Sicily. When Plato arrived, he found the court of Dionysius the Younger seething with intrigue. A number of influential courtiers remembered the intellectual dandy from his previous visit, and some of them appeared to have it in for Dion as well. Within a few months, these enemies of philosophy contrived to have both Plato and Dion accused of treason, a frequent pitfall for those who schemed to set up a utopia. At first the carpenter king wasn't sure what to do. Then, fearful of Dion's power, 
he banished his uncle but refused to allow Plato to leave. He didn't want Plato saying bad things about him when he returned to Athens, he informed the old philosopher. Fortunately, friends soon managed to engineer Plato's escape, and he returned to Athens where his faithful disciples and Dion were waiting for him at the academy.